This program is brought to you by the Center for a Sustainable Today. Our world is an amazing, complex living organism, and we coexist in a symbiotic relationship. With this great power comes a great responsibility, a responsibility to ensure the future by taking steps to be sustainable today. And now, here is the host of Sustainable Today. Hello, and welcome to Sustainable Today. I'm Sherry Steller, your host. Americans are concerned about economic growth. But what exactly does economic growth mean and how should we measure it? Most Americans, as well as citizens of industrialized countries, have been acculturated to accept GDP as the de facto standard of growth. The more products and services we produce, the more we're growing, right? Or are we? What are the negative consequences of that growth and what positive outcomes are either skewed or not even captured by that metric? What happens when we evaluate growth within the inherent limits of sustainability and ecological carrying capacity? Isn't it really individual well-being and collective social progress that we desire? Today, we'll be examining this complex topic with the help of two industry experts. We have uh, Dr. Robert Costanza from Portland State University and also Dr. Josh Farley from the University of Vermont. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Now, we have some interesting activities that involve the topic of growth to share with you. Since the subject of growth encompasses a wide range of issues, there are other factors to consider, both economic and ethical. The news today suggests the scale of the human enterprise has outgrown our planet. We survive today only by borrowing vital resources from future generations, yet we persist on a business-as-usual course. Why? Three powerful forces prevent us from making the progress required. The cultural myth that growth is necessary for prosperity, propaganda and undue influence from growth profiteers, and our inability to appropriately assess dangers that don't appear to be immediate. In a new documentary called Hooked on Growth, filmmaker David Gardner tackles some of these thorny issues. We had the opportunity to talk with him recently through our partners at Peak Moment TV. Here's what he had to say. The American dream could be about to become a nightmare. We can have a culture of sustainability or a culture of growth, and when it's time for us to choose. I'm working on a film that helps us to look in the mirror and identify this culture of growth and what are, what are the values, what are the myths that are keeping us from reacting rationally to the evidence that we're hitting the limits to growth today. Some of these icebergs are melting. You can feel, there we are. The collapse of all fish and seafood species by 2050. We've had um, food riots. World energy demand will grow by 50%. This water manager telling me we can't keep up with a growing population. At least 36 states will face water shortages. America's population could hit 1 billion people. People have seen a nearly 40 cent hike in gas prices in a single day. What is going on here? What is going on here? For a long time, more and better, we're pretty much in the same direction. When we were really poor, um, each increment of uh, economic prosperity brought with it a certain quanta of human satisfaction. Accelerating economic growth somehow in, in the minds of people who don't understand what's going on, that means better lives for people. What we have is this human desire to become bigger and to become richer. Growth is presented as the solution to problems it has never solved. A future of hope and opportunity begins with a growing economy. We are a nation of consumers. I want it all. The ka of Christmas. Consumers like us, Natalie, account for two-thirds of this economy. It's good for America when the consumer spends money. 
The economy, well, it didn't grow fast enough. We have consumption growing only 1.8 percent. A lot of negative economic news. A quarter million jobs lost. Consumer spending took its biggest dive. The economy was receding. Major sectors of America's financial system are at risk of shutting down. This is America's economic Pearl Harbor. We are facing the greatest economic challenge of our lifetime. It's a race to correct an economy that's deteriorating daily. Somewhere between seven and eight trillion dollars has been pledged, loaned, yeah. or spent to stimulate this economy. We are now being, for the first time in history, faced with this discontinuity that you, that what we have been doing for the last thousand years is unsustainable. Now, we no longer find ourselves growing happier as our economy grows or even as our individual prosperity grows. Individuals get wealthy from promoting growth, but if that's just a few individuals, but all the rest of us have to pay the price. We are changing and have changed the atmosphere to the point where we're threatening our very uh, sustainability. We are causing an extinction of the working parts of our life support systems, that is the other animals and the plants and the microorganisms of the planet at a scale unseen in the last 65 million years. And there's this culture of growth and the culture of sustainability. They're going to have to choose. We keep thinking we can grow forever. And the resource limitation is, is upon us. You know, that's almost un-American to stop growth or to be talking about stopping growth. They assume that we can grow forever or if we can't grow forever, that the end of growth is so far out there that we don't need to include it in this plan. Only people who have to kind of take off their shoes to count up to 20 don't understand we have a population problem. Human beings have used more natural resources since the end of World War II than in all of human history before. At some point, human economic growth is going to doom our children we can have a transition to a sustainable economy, but trying to overpower the institutional and psychic inheritance that growth has left us is going to be very difficult. It's like a drug addict is strung out on growth. You've got to have growth, you've got to have your, your drug in order to just maintain normalcy. The, the good news is that there's still a wonderful life that we can leave our children. Sounds like here's where we are. Dave, tell us about the film. In a nutshell, uh, we are seeking the cure for growth addiction. Uh, the film Hooked on Growth takes a look at our uh, modern society and asks why are we behaving irrationally. When you think about it, if you look in the news, it's not hard to see overwhelming evidence that we are hitting the limits to growth today. There is a silent killer in our society affecting the lives of millions. Chances are it has struck your neighbors, your boss, and elected officials. Tragically, it's affecting our children and their future. The news reports species are disappearing, water tables dropping, and ice melting. Fertile soil is eroding, and people are starving. But the reports don't name the cause. They don't mention its name. The killer is growth addiction, an insatiable craving for more, for ever-growing economies, ever-expanding cities, increasing consumption, and more and more people. Is it like a runaway, you know, illusion, but it's still runaway? It I mean, is. Have you seen anything halting it other than natural forces? We are on a, you know, it's like we are on a, in a convertible with Thelma and Louise <laughs> speeding toward a cliff, you know? And we are, we, the cliff is out there, but it's just, it just seems distant enough that we don't recognize it. So we're in that speeding convertible and we're, right now we're tuning, the, retuning the radio, but we haven't really changed our direction. Uh, and, and Paul Ehrlich, one of the, uh, the biologist who I, uh, one of the biologists I've interviewed, he says, you know, all we're doing is delaying collapse by a few weeks or a few months, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's that sort of inevitable is what he's saying. It's if we don't make major changes. I mean, we really need a major paradigm shift. 
the current thinking uh, from the scientists out there is that we're using anywhere from 30 to 40 percent more of the Earth's resources than, uh, than is sustainable. Now we we can get by with that temporarily, but uh, but what but that we're means is we're it from the future. Yeah, we're liquidating the planet of its resources, okay. so right. we can't do that forever. I've talked a lot about economic growth, but also population growth is a part of the the subject, uh, and that's a, something I hope to explain well in the film. Is that uh, you know you population and consul consumption multiply each other, and so if you have a lot of population, you have to have a whole lot less consumption to come up with a sustainable balance. Okay. If you have uh, a lot of consumption, then you have to have a much smaller population. We're still forecasting more people, no relief in sight for the foreseeable future. Beside the traffic jams and smog, food and water shortages are predicted. We can look forward to fisheries collapse as well. It's not looking good for greenhouse gas emissions either. If there's one solution to the challenges facing our planet today, it's to quit chasing more and to begin embracing less. And while less consumption and emission are critical parts of any solution, they can't be effective if we don't have less population as well. The world is not sustainable at the present population. We have too many people. We're already way, way above what the planet can sustain in the long term. The whole reason that consumption has become an issue is because there are so many of us that there is not enough to share for all. The most recent calculations are that a sustainable population, which gave people a maximum number of options, would be about two billion or one and a half billion people. So the key is to bring population to a stable level. Whether it's food or water shortages, climate change, species extinction, or peak oil, every problem is multiplied by increasing population. If you manage somehow to half each person's consumption on average, but you allow population size to double, you haven't gained at all. Because if you have half as much consumption per person, but twice as many persons, you're right where you started from. That strikes me as one of the most tricky topics of all. I mean, you've got, you've got millions of years human history, you know, of having enough people to keep the tribe together and scarcity or whatever, a and religious and a lot of beliefs that we, I mean, th th that has to go counter to. Totally. So. And I guess it's the rebel in me that makes me, you know, that attracts me to that kind of subject. Why is it? It's become such a taboo to talk about it. Uh, and people make a lot of assumptions about your motives, they make a lot of assumptions about what your solutions are before you ever sure. even open your mouth with sure. those. Sure. You want to do population control the first moment. You say population control and I don't get a choice and all kinds of yeah. yeah, and so I want to explore that. I'm not necessarily going to offer a prescription, but I think it, you know, the more we talk about it, the more open we are about it, we, can, we take away the power of the taboo to keep us from acting yeah. rationally. Um, but another thing is that, and this is kind of unique about my film, there's certainly been other films about the, you know, the end of empire and economic growth and peak oil and, and uh, unsustainability. But one of the things I hope to do in my film is show people how what we're doing at the community level really makes a huge difference. Mm. We can't have a sustainable world if it's full of communities that have unsustainable uh, goals of economic growth and population growth. So, you know, we talk about sustainable community planning. I think that the, you know, the key thing is that we have to recognize that we cannot grow forever because current models of planning are based on an endless growth scenario. What we've typically been doing in the past is subsidizing and encouraging growth as much as possible without any reservations. So most communities have been pursuing pedal to the metal growth. Subsidize as much as possible, encourage it as much as possible, make sure that every policy that you have uh, facilitates and induces as much growth as possible. So to say that you can't influence growth, I think is, uh, is, is ridiculous. We have lots of ways of influencing growth and one of them is to stop encouraging it. Right now we're drinking the Kool-Aid. Every news report, every headline, yes. every yes. broadcaster really celebrates growth. And I think even the people who walk out of the film saying, I don't buy it, they will never read that headline quite the same. They'll start hmm. on the right path. Join the movement. Together, we can find the cure. Well, that was an interesting clip. What do you think of that title, Hooked on Growth? Yes, I, I think it's a great title because I think we are 
in a sense, hooked on growth. It's, it's something that's not really contributing any longer to our, our sustainable well-being, uh, and yet we keep pursuing that, that goal inappropriately. So I think we need to, to, uh, to get off of, of, uh, of growth, get off of, of, uh, of oil. Mm -hmm. you know, even President Bush acknowledged that we were addicted to oil. Uh, we're addicted to consumption and we're addicted to this idea of economic growth when it's no longer really contributing to our, our well-being. Is it fair to say that what most Americans and citizens of industrialized nations probably regard as growth is predicated on the notion of GDP and even maybe before John Maynard Keynes, Adam Smith and the invisible hand? Well, well GDP was really, a, uh, came after World War II, you know, and it was a, an attempt to try to measure uh, our, our economic activity and productivity. It was never designed as a measure of economic well-being or welfare. And so the problem is that we've confused it with that. GDP, production of economic marketed goods and services, is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And certainly in that period, that was something that did contribute to improving uh, welfare and well-being. But there are many other things that contribute to well-being and welfare, and they're outside the market system. They're not measured by, by GDP. And so there's two issues. There's one is, you know, how do we actually measure what we truly want? And the other is, how does having the wrong measures and pursuing increasing the wrong measure affect us? And you could look at today with the current financial crisis. We define that as two uh, quarters without economic growth. We don't care about misery. We don't care about poverty. We don't care about unemployment. So is our effort to increase GMP to return to that growth of GMP, employing one hedge fund manager who makes $3 billion a year is the same as employing um, 100,000 uh, you know, uh, heads of families who make $30,000 a year. Uh, the problem is that we're, we're not living in that world anymore. We're in a world now where all the external costs, all the things that GDP doesn't measure that are both negative and positive, the things that it doesn't pick up that are positive, are now much more important uh, than, than the things that it does pick up. So all the stuff outside the market is really more important than the stuff that GDP picks up. So there are alternative measures of, of, uh, of well-being, this thing called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Actually, yeah, the GPI. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, uh, you know, it adds things like uh, the value of volunteer work and, and, uh, and household labor, which are left out of GDP. It, it accounts for the distribution of, of income uh, because that's a, a prime contributor to people's sense of well-being. You know, a dollar's worth of income to a rich person doesn't really contribute as much additional welfare as a dollar's worth of income to a poor person. So you have to adjust for the income distribution. And that lack of uh, 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 the income distribution actually affects a whole range of social problems that we're, that we're uh, as we're learning. Um, and then it subtracts all of the things that shouldn't be counted as positives. The cost of crime, the cost of pollution, air and water pollution, the loss of natural capital and social capital assets. And when you do that for the U.S., you find that, you know, since 1975 or so, uh, we haven't really been making any real progress. Our genuine progress has been relatively flat. So if you look at an individual and you talk about growth, and for many people these days that means I need a job, I need to buy goods and services for my family just to, you know, make it day to day. How do you, how do you reconcile this against this larger picture of a genuine progress index in terms of um, introducing more qualitative components with, through the lens of sustainability. I guess sustainability is two things. It's how we use our natural resources to, a, a, you know, is the what we have side. And then in terms of creating what we want is the other end of sustainability. We've got to use those to create a desirable end. People say we need economic growth um, because without economic growth, we're not going to create the jobs we need. And without economic growth, we're going to be condemned to poverty. We'll always have people in poverty. We need to grow our way out of poverty. So I think the problem is that um, there's no evidence, first of all, that we do grow our way, our way out of poverty. Our per capita consumption, as I mentioned earlier, has more than doubled since 1969. Poverty rates are higher. We really need to focus our, refocus our priorities. If our goal is to increase ever more production, ignoring the workers, then we focus just on the output side. We really need to redesign our society to provide employment for the workers and where jobs is not just consumption that's the end activity, it's the jobs. We create rewarding, meaningful jobs that keep people happy instead of consumption. We don't know all the exact answers, but we do know if we lay forward things we need to focus on providing, on um, equality, on employment, on ending poverty, we'll dedicate the resources to that. If we focus simply on growth, we'll dedicate the resources to that. Um, again, that, you know, that we're pursuing the wrong goal there, it's time, and it's time to switch. It's time to get unaddicted, to get mm -hmm. off of, get unhooked from growth. As the public debate over growth continues, many authors, scholars, and just ordinary people have weighed in on the discussion. We have found a clever video that asks the question, what is too much?
from Leo Murray at the Royal College of Art in England. really isn't about polar bears anymore. At this very moment, the fate of civilization itself hangs in the balance. It turns out that the way we've been calculating the future impacts of climate change up to now has been missing a really important piece of the picture. It seems that we are now dangerously close to the tipping point in the world's climate systems. This is the point of no return, after which truly catastrophic changes become inevitable. Think of it like this. For the past three million years, our planet's climate has always been in one or the other of two stable states, with small changes in solar radiation providing the energy to push us from one to the other. When we're in this cooler dip, the planet has an ice age. When we're in this warmer one, the planet's climate is very much as it is now and has been throughout the whole of human history. The problem is that our use of fossil fuels is pushing us further and further out of our little stable dip and up the far slope of this hill. The tipping point is the point at which we cross the peak of the hill and we no longer need to keep pushing to keep the planet moving towards a much hotter place. It will just keep rolling onwards all on its own. This tipping point exists because of a set of positive feedbacks in the climate system mechanisms that can amplify the effects of man-made warming and lead to runaway change. Each feedback in the system has its own internal tipping point and it is the relationships within this complex, mutually reinforcing system that have been missing from our climate prediction models. So far, we've only pushed up global temperatures by around 0.8 degrees centigrade. But because of the 40 or 50 year time lag between emissions and temperature rise, the emissions already in the atmosphere commit us to raising temperatures by around another 0.6 degrees over the coming decades, which could easily be enough to place us right at the peak of the hill, or even over it. If we do pass this critical threshold, global temperatures could soar by as much as six degrees. If this happens, the natural world will suffer a mass extinction event which will wipe out the majority of the plants and animals with which we currently share the planet. Although there will be a lot more rats, flies, cockroaches and mosquitoes as the world's ecosystems go into meltdown. The first human impacts will come in the form of steeply declining access to fresh water. As rainfall patterns change, glacier-fed rivers dry up, and rising sea levels contaminate reservoirs. As crops fail, forests burn, deserts spread, and coastal regions flood permanently, people will start to pack up their things in their billions and move on in search of a better life elsewhere. But where? Humanity may survive this, but what will humanity mean in a world where countries which remain habitable, like Britain, spend most of our remaining resources fighting to keep out the starving millions who can no longer live in their own countries because of what we have done. The world is awash with weapons. Enough firearms to arm one in every seven human beings on the planet. As the world's ability to support the huge numbers of people alive today dwindles, we will not die peacefully in our sleep. Okay, here's the good news. None of this is inevitable, yet. This is not the time to panic or to despair. This is the time to act while we still can. We need to recognize that there is a huge question mark over whether governments and corporations are capable of responding to this threat in the time we have left. They've had 20 years already and still have less than nothing to show for it. This is because they remain committed to a doctrine that prioritizes endless short-term economic growth 
over the survival of human life on Earth. There's no great mystery about what we need to do to reduce emissions in line with the science. We simply need to consume less. But that is out of the question in a society which is founded on the ever-increasing consumption of material resources and energy. Nobody has all of the answers, but we do know that this is not the only way to live. And given that it's almost certainly going to kill us all, we'd better start looking urgently at some of the alternatives. It's now very clear that in order to actually win the fight against climate change, making big changes to the way we each live our own lives is not going to be enough. We're also going to have to actively confront powerful vested interests who will stop at nothing to prevent the changes we need from taking place. We have to be more than just consumers. These are extraordinary times. Preventing runaway global warming is the single most important task in all of human history, and it's fallen to us to do it. If we don't, then everything else we work to achieve in our lives will be destroyed or become meaningless. Those who came before us didn't know about this problem, and those who come after will be powerless to do anything about it. But for us, there's still time. We better get a move on though. That was um, some interesting food for thought. <laughs> yes, um, you know we can manage. In fact, we can do better uh, if we get unaddicted to uh, to growth. So it's not a sacrifice. Uh, to stop um, growth in the conventional sense anyway. Uh, it's a sacrifice not to. And, and we have to remember that there are no natural systems that continue to grow indefinitely. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, what, how would you feel if your body kept growing you know, exponentially you know, from birth until, well, until how old you are now? I mean, <laughs> I you, say, would be, you would be much most bigger than- Most people stop growing in one direction. <laughs> exactly, you, should be, you would be much bigger than this, this room or, or even this planet you know, if you kept growing at that rate. So natural systems level off, they continue to improve. And they begin to focus at some point on inc improving quality rather than, than increasing uh, quantity. So this is, this is what all natural systems do, and, and economic systems are not immune to the, the laws of nature. I think there is a real shift going on, both you know, in terms of the thinking about this issue and, and also the culture uh, around it. And I think there has to be this shift. We have to change our vision and, and our behavior if we really want to create this better future. I wish we could continue this really important topic of growth and we'll do so on our website at www.sustainabletoday.org. Gentlemen, thank you so much, Dr. Josh Harley and uh, Dr. Robert Costanza, um, University of Vermont and Portland State University. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here in the studios. I'm Sherry Stellar saying thank you to all of you, our viewers and supporters, as we all continue bringing you the tools to be sustainable today. Can feel the power of the noonday sun, a blazing ball of fire up above, shining light and warmth enough for everyone, a gift to every nation from a star. It's a big, beautiful planet in the sky. It's my home. It's where I live. Others.